All right, so firstly, I should preface this by saying, uh, I'll try to live by this statement of strong opinions weekly held, and there's things that I believe because I've had experiences, um, they're evidence-based, but ultimately there's nothing that I hold on to too tightly that if I'm presented with strong enough alternative information that I'm not willing to change my mind. So there was always a bit of reluctance to me, to be honest, early on in my career about speaking up on podcasts or speaking at events like this, because the, the honest truth is I change my mind so regularly as I get exposed to different people, different ideas, um, it's an evolving process. What I've come to realize is that actually sharing some of that information is what, uh, is what helps that evolutionary process. So um, particularly probably over the last uh, six to nine months in particular, myself and uh, Nathan Spencer spoke earlier. We met on our, the ACA Level 3 course. We are two, two noses texting each other at nine o'clock at night about articles we saw and YouTube clips we've seen. And uh, sharing that information has really helped evolve my thinking as well. All right, so. A little origin on the, this uh, story, my first ever presentation, the first iteration of the story, ASA presentation, pre-COVID. Had agreed to do one for the ASA with Warren Young, who, and everyone who's come across Warren Young, he's an absolute gun and a legend in our field. Had never missed a day of work, missed five days in a row, absolutely dying sick. Um, on the morning of the presentation, my wife said to me, she's like, you cannot go do this presentation. Like, you are, you're cooked, don't do it. I said, no, can't leave people down. Went up, stood in front of a group of people like this, spoke for maybe three minutes, lost my way, stopped talking. People exaggerate about how long they're not talking in front of an audience. It was maybe not 10, but it was definitely longer than five minutes of complete silence. So most people do the applause at the end. I wonder if we pass the seven minute mark and stand up, do standing ovation, because that's progression on, uh, on some, of this, some of this work here. All right, but my advice off the back of that was, that story was to tell a little story about what you're trying to tell. And this is my story. So. Uh, we work in, I work in professional sport, Carmen professional sport, um, Nathan, sport's big business, right, sport's big business, growing all the time, we're working in major leagues with athletes worth hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, performing for organisations that are valued in the billions, playing in leagues that are, that are valued in the multiple billions. Um, this has led to an exponential growth in the support services around us, what funds our job, essentially, as these sort of roles. And so alongside that, you've had this growth in strength conditioning, in sports science. But ultimately, what problem to realize is that the only people that have and see inherent value in what we do is the people within this room in that profession that have an inherent, inherent interest in it. And that really our role is to, is, is to support the broader organizational goals and to support the end product. Um, and yet, yeah, although we're, we're really passionate about the industry and progressing it and coming to events like this, Ultimately, that's not the end product of what we're trying to do. We're trying to support a much bigger, a much greater whole. This is where I think we're at, and this was definitely me a couple of years ago. This is the outbreak. We all love sports science, s &C. We spend our, there's not many professions where you're coming, spending up your, giving up your Saturdays, coming to an event like this, listening to podcasts, talking to professionals. But because we're so passionate about what we're doing, and we're so invested in it, it's as much a vocation and a hobby as it is, as it is an occupation. So quite a few, well, not that long ago, actually, four or five years ago, I'm the bloke on the left here. I've been bitten by the bug of SNC and working in professional sport, and I love it. I am knees deep in it. I am reading research papers. I'm attending conferences. I'm getting deep in the minutia. And I'm having these sort of questions. I'm like talking about MAS protocols versus a ASO protocols. I'm talking about RFD measures and whether we're using an ISO mid thigh pull or a belt squat um, isometric or a uh, Barbell and ISO squat. I'm going to show you a diagram in a while that's just insane. The level of depth they're looking at molecular signaling for maximizing either conditioning responses or uh, responses to hypertrophy training. All very valuable, but head coach here or GM or whoever it is on the right side might. What are we doing here? Like, what about the actual football program? So, I'll tell you a bit about my personal journey. And I've said the contrasting experiences here and the philosophy fallacy. What I actually realize I'm talking about is an actual philosophical approach, but it sounds cool, doesn't it? Philosophy fallacy kind of runs quite well and raises the point. What I'm really talking about is a, a technical philosophy, I think, here. But I had two very contrasting experiences. I started my career at a very well-resourced and very successful club in Leicester Tigers in the UK, competing in the Premiership. 11-time um, Premiership winners, two-time European Cup winners. I was fortunate to be part of a number of grand finals there and grand final success. My first four years in sport were all grand finals. What I realize now a decade later is those uh, days like that are actually quite rare. 
contrast that to my time in Super Rugby with the Melbourne Rebels, another great organization, but it's a, it's a lower resourced organization trying to establish itself, trying to build a culture, trying to impose itself on a league. Um, traditionally being a mid to lower end of the table team, they've only been in existence for 10 years or so. Um, very contrasting experiences uh, across those. And I put up, so that's uh, the last premiership I was involved in 2013 with Leicester Tigers. And what looks like a happy picture, well it is a happy picture on the right, my time with the uh, Melbourne Rebels, but that's actually 2017 where we won one game in, in the whole year, and that's our one win. So the reason we're so happy there, there's two instances of being happy actually, is that we beat the Waratahs last minute, our only win for the season, and then our last game of the year, sitting in the sheds, we had a pretty good time because all of us knew that there was no way everyone in that room was going to be together again because there was going to be a clear out for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so two very different contrasting experiences. But for me, I don't think I really appreciated those differences at the, at the start. And I just want to highlight some of the, some of the differences here. Um, Leicester Tigers, the club, 130 years of history. Uh, Rebels, it was, it was four years old when I joined in, uh, in 2015. I'd actually been at my previous job longer than the Melbourne Rebels had been in existence when I came into it. Um, very established culture, history, style of play. Rebels, on the other hand, trying to establish an identity, trying to establish itself in the league, changes of coaches, and as a result, an evolving game style. Much greater resources in the UK, we had a salary cap of around the 10 million mark, plus two marquee players, so reality was probably between 11 and 12 million. Contrast that to probably less than half when you're in a super rugby team. Um, Leicester Tigers, destination club for top players. Players went there if you wanted to win premierships, play for England, play for the Lions. The Rebels, on the other hand, trying to attract talent, trying to get people in, getting in academy players, getting in players who can cut from other, um, other programs to establish a team. Different competition structure, close to 40 games if you went all the way to finals in the UK, which we often did. Marathon type season, contrast that to Super Rugby, you're playing 15 to 20 games, it's a sprint. Big resource of players below that, when I think back to my time at Leicester, our first choice player would have been an international player, our second choice in that position would have been an international player, our third choice was probably an under 21 international. Full time academy, always players coming through, all the time. 30 players fully on the books, attending school, eating together, training together with the first team, or available for the first team I should say. Contrast that to the Rebels, very much a part time academy model, much less talent, um, much less depth in, in, um, throughout the squad essentially. So, two very, very contrasting experiences. Um, and this was my thought process at the time. When I was at Leicester Tigers, we had this philosophy, is a point on this? We had this uh, philosophical approach of, we build the engine and the coaches tune it. So essentially our job was to develop physiology. Um, in hindsight, pretty reductionist, uh, pretty reductionist to post. For anyone who's unsure or unfamiliar with the theme of reductionism, belief that a complex system can be broken down into the sum of its parts. So here's an example here of what I used to spend my time doing all the time at Leicester and, and maybe this is a, an important process to go through but the top of it, you probably can't even read it because there's just so much nonsense on there, well not nonsense, it's science but um, the title of that slide is Mechanisms of Skeletal Muscle Hypertrophy and all the different chemical cascades that link to that, uh, link to that process. Obviously a lot of detail, a lot of detail. Um, I viewed my role when I was at Leicester Tigers when I came to the Rebels first as being a strength and conditioning coach tasked with developing physical capabilities and capacities and then passing that athlete, that, the athlete, onto the football coaches to then transfer into a football perspective. The way we did that was to run a really low system bias um, training program, interventions. I'll give an example for our lower body strength, like we would leg press everyone. So we thought, geez, we can get more load on here, change muscle architecture, increase recruitment, um, that's our primary tool. We can take away the technical aspect of even a squat or a deadlift and we can maximize that. Reducing everything down into its component parts, trying to maximize physiology, uh, trying to build the engine, passing that process onto the, the football coaches to do it. Um, ironically, I think quite differently to this now, but as I said, this is the most successful point in my career too or most successful that teams I've been involved with have been. I was going through a bit of an evolutionary process anyway. Um, I remember watching this game, for anyone who's a rugby union fan, Japan beat South Africa in the 2015 World Cup. Um, massive upset, and this quote from Eddie Jones, I remember reading this afterwards and it really, really resonated with me. Um, 
Essentially, you had really two contrasting styles of play. South Africa, uh, powerhouse in the game of international game of rugby union, multiple World Cup winners. Japan, I've improved a lot, but certainly classes in Mino at the time, 80 to 1 odds. I played a really contrasting style, up, up tempo game, high intensity game, uh, moved this big South African team around, broke them down, beat them, famous win. Uh, and this quote really resonated with me. I thought, geez, man, we're, it's the same game. Jeez, it's different ways of playing. And we talk about game demands, and that's our language. But really, the game has rules. The game has pitch size and posts and a scoring system. It's how we play it that has demands, essentially. All right. This process, and um, it was an evolving kind of coaching process, so we'll go through anyway at the Melbourne Rebels. But the principle here of tactical periodization, which I'm sure we've all heard of, this was a real gateway to me into this. Uh, this thinking around, or this uh, thought process around systems thinking. So, tactical periodization uh, model that originated in professional soccer um, through a Portuguese academic originally, Victor Freire, but influenced a lot of Portuguese coaches, Jose Mourinho, Andre Villas Boas, Pep Guardiola runs a modified kind of version of this, this tactical periodization model as well. But Eddie Jones is talking about this different contrasting game style and how athletes need to be different to perform this game. Um, led me to this this concept of tactical periodization. I was fortunate to be around Bryce Kavanagh at the time, who's the one who brought me over here. He's now head of performance at England Soccer, very versed in this sort of thinking long before it was kind of mainstream. And Dean Benton, who I worked with at uh, Rugby Australia, also, also helped me grow this mindset. But tactical periodization is the first thing that really got me thinking about um, the role that physical interventions have on the style of play that we're trying to do, or that we're trying to impose. So the game model essentially is the coach's vision of how the team wants to play, um, that the game model guides the training process from the very beginning. And that's not just the technical or tactical game process, it's also how we prepare our athletes mentally, physically, sorry, mentally, physically, and socially to perform in this environment. And this uh, principle of specificity is really the, the key point of it. And there's a permanent relationship between all dimensions of the game, technical, tactical, physical, mental, and that all training sessions are representative of this, this style of play, that things are interconnected, that it's not, it woke me up to the fact that it's not about reducing things down to isolated components and then trying to bring them back together. We're actually looking at the whole all the time. There's interconnectedness between these components. I was fortunate that we were going through a bit of an evolutionary style anyway in the, in the Rebels. Um, uh, Dave Vessels here who came in as head coach following that uh, poor season in 2017. And this is pretty early doors, but this is essentially what was our version of tactical periodization at the time. We were kind of all going through this iterative process, very much version one of trying to identify what's the actual sign signature style of play for this rugby team and then how can we how can we support that? This is my first kind of exposure to a more interconnected and integrated, integrated system. There's a bit of jargon in here that's uh, you know, specific to the Rebels in 2018, which is a long time ago, but essentially it's breaking down um, the key pillars of our game and then the sub-components, the underlying technical components that support it. And then as an athletic performance department, we went away and we tried to understand what are the underpinning physical components which support these technical actions that the head coach is trying to, trying to elicit. That's my very first exposure and, and a real shift in thought process from a really reductionist point of view to thinking more holistically about how the team are trying to play through this tactical, tactical periodization model. So this really triggered a, a change in thought process for me. And I see information like this or tweets like this all the time. Um, this talk about, there's been lots of talk about sports specificity, but that across sports, that a lot of the commonalities for essentially that across sports we do a lot of the same things and of course this is true i agree with all this sprinting throws loaded power etc if you walk into a perth glory gym session or a sydney swans gym session or an orlando magic gym session or a training session you're going to see some commonalities people will be doing some lower body strength and some hamstring work and they'll be doing some mobility but it's not the 85 to 90 percent that's the not that it's the unimportant bit, but just because something makes up 10 to 15% of the portion doesn't mean it carries 10% of the importance. 10 to 15% is a lot. It's a lot. There's between 96 and 98% commonality across our genome between any of us sitting in this room and a chimpanzee. A lot of commonality, two, two to 4%, we're very different. 10 to 15% is the difference between winning the London Marathon and being a recreational runner. That's a big, that's a big difference. 10 to 15% is the difference between 
Usain Bolt holding the world record and someone who can't qualify for an under 18s national championship final probably in, in Australia. So the 10 15 is a significant difference. It's a lot. So I think you ought to ask some, raise me, help me to raise some questions about that 10 to 15 percent. What does success look like for this organization? What, how can I support this? What's, the, what's our 10 to 15 percent? How are we trying to play the game? What's this iteration of the game model? What technical actions underpin this tactical vision? How are we trying to play the game? And then how can I support that or how can we support that? This question here, where does physical development fit in the performance hierarchy, I think is a really important one and stuff that isn't asked enough. I heart back to my time at um, Leicester Tigers. When I came in there, I thought my role was to maximize physical variables. I thought that was my role. I didn't ask the question of how important at this time is physical development or athletic performance in the hierarchy of us achieving our organizational, our organizational goals. How does the physical dimension interact with technical, tactical and psychological uh, factors within the team and within the organization? What impact am I having from either uh, taking physical and cognitive load and taking it from my area where maybe it could be better spent in other areas of the program which will help maximize performance? Um, yeah, how are my decisions impacting those around me? So, off the back of that experience, spending time in, at Leicester Tigers, at Melbourne Rebels, um, I, I should actually talk a little bit quickly about that transition a little bit more, so I'm probably skipping over maybe some of the most, uh, Carmen just raised me when Carmen asked about the biggest impact to me. I, I, I came into the Melbourne Rebels with what I viewed as a role of, um, of improving, one of my primary remits was improving the strength and power qualities of the players. I came in with the view that, well, if I can come in, I can hammer this, I'm going to increase this variable, we're going to get better as a, as a football team. I had two, not significant injuries, but two injuries in my first three months in the Melbourne Rebels. Two players missed games, injured on Thursday, back spasm, missed game on Saturday. We lost both of those games, both the key players, in a short period of time. Because I was pushing the physical variable at the extent of other considerations for the team, because I felt that was my role. When Carmen talks about what impacts, or what's shaped your philosophy, and interest, that's the one that's impacted me, where I realized, geez, I'm trying to push this, this variable because I think it's important when actually it's having a negative impact on what we're trying to achieve holistically as an organization. So it's led me to these kind of uh, conclusions here on what I think the role of the athletic performance coach, the athletic development coach is in the team sports setting. I think sports specificity exists. It's 10 to 15%. That's a real thing. That's a difference between, there's a difference between football and rugby and, and AFL. Not only does sports specificity exist, I think organizational specificity exists. Your 10 to 15% is understanding what's important for your organization and how can you best support that. The best athletic performance intervention or best athletic performance SNC program is the one which is most appropriate to support those organizational goals. That's a key one. The strength and conditioning program, athletic performance program doesn't exist in isolation. We collectively share the responsibility to tune the engine along with the technical coaches. That's one, understanding the physical variables that support those technical actions. It's also understanding when to be more considerate of the other factors in the program. Shifting or optimizing, I spoke about my role at uh, Leicester Tigers where I felt my role was to maximize physical capabilities. There's a shift in mentality there from con uh, getting concerned with maximizing physical variables versus optimizing them in the presence of other inputs. So how, how it was what I'm doing affecting and interacting with the technical component, the tactical component and the psychological component. All right, <laughs> all right. This is my personal vaccine. I said this is me a few years ago. I'm the bloke on the table here. They're like 2017. I was the only staff member I think to survive the the cut. I was like, uh, you know, I was waiting for that conversation. They're like, we're gonna let you go. I'm like, mate, look at the squat numbers. They're good. Yo-yo's good. That's not that's not what it's about, eh? So I um, started a bit of study, off the back of those experiences, I've actually started a, a bit of study, and I think there's a bit of a gap at the minute in the applied practice. Um, I think there's a wealth and depth of technical knowledge, of foundational knowledge, of academic knowledge, and then the applied knowledge we're forced to kind of learn along the way, picking up bits and pieces. This quote here being a magpie I got from Jim Collins, who does a lot of work, not in SNC, but in coaching theory and coaching science more generally. And he calls, uh, has this premise of expert coaches being magpies. Essentially, we've learned just by picking things up, having experiences, you know, making the wrong decision with someone, having the wrong conversation with the coach. I guess my belief is that we can maybe uh, combine the things that I've learned and Carmen's learned and Nathan's learned and Jonas has learned and we can combine those and we can actually 
keen to do a bit of study on that, then maybe we can collate that, some of that information and be able to pass that back. Um, the hypothesis of my study and of my experience is that more experienced practitioners, experienced practitioners are making decisions that are more considerate of wider organizational goals and not just on. Index ball and soft ball, and we must record indicates the number of wins and losses credited to a pitcher. Would you like to hear more? No, I'm good, thank you. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, geez, there you go. That loses your train of thought. Okay, um, so the premise of my study is I think we can collate some of that information. I think we can tap into the collective knowledge that we have uh, across practitioners and help us all make better decisions. So I'm uh, quite lucky here. I'm working with a pretty good team, Lachlan James, Warren Young, Scott Tapley, and uh, Paul Gaston, who are helping me trying to formalize some of these thoughts and, thoughts and turn them into an academic process and, and hopefully be able to give something back to the industry um, at the end of it. But here's where I'm at at the minute. Okay. This would be a bit of an introduction to the premise of uh, emergence and systems thinking. But, right, we're involved in the technical field. That's what we're involved in. We're involved in the scientific field. We're constantly seeking objectivity. But the organization or the team that we're working for is a social construct. It's a makeup of people. A definition of, the de by definition, a social contract, uh, social construct is going to have social problems. There's going to be different opinions among different stakeholders about what the issues are for your organization and how best to solve them. And therefore, I was actually speaking to John Pryor about this recently, he was a very abstract thinker about performance. I presented this slide to him and he said to me, this, this is the essence of being in team sport. He's like, the solution to any of these problems by definition is going to be ambiguous. There's not going to be an absolute truth. You're not going to have absolutely one answer to what the solution is. <clears throat> Social problems. They're not amenable to solely technical solutions. And inherently, I think we know this. We know that we want to get guys faster and stronger, but we also know in the team sports setting that increasing lower body strength does not mean you win more football games. We know that increasing velocity from 9.5 to 9.7, yes, it's good, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to, you're going to make the right decision when you play. And there's no absolute truth when it comes to team performance. So it's a complex environment, and it's not a, it's not, there's no absolute truth. So how do we make decisions in this environment? So I've had this experience and it's got me, when I look into the research a little bit more, I start this uh, principle of emergence and this concept of systems thinking keeps popping up. And this really resonates with me because this is how I behaved in my Leicester days and coming across. A lot of the time in Western society we have a habit of taking a complex problem, taking a system, breaking it down into its components parts, breaking it down into medical and SNC, as Cameron mentioned, staying in your lane technical coaches, line-out coach, forwards coach, mid coach, and we think if we improve those individual areas and we bring them all back together, that we're going to have an improved product. The, the issue with this is that, that it's possible to improve one part of this area and it to be at the detriment of another, or even to improve an area and it to be at the cost of the system function as a whole, the team performance as a whole. For example, this might be in the SNC, uh, in the SNC realm, really driving lower body strength because that's a key variable, you making that as your key decision and it not fitting in with the technical demands or tactical demands of a particular day, the, the quality of the execution of the following session is, is not as impactful as it could be because of the decision you made to maximize your subcomponent. And so a sporting organization has emergent properties. It's a complex system and it results in the interaction of the relationships among its agents, everyone that's involved in working in there, physios, SNCs, coaches, GM staff. Um, and an emergent property, this is probably the key part, is said to have properties that are more than the sum of its parts. Or well, it's more accurate to say that an emergent property has different properties than the, than the individual components. And we see that, we see that all the time. As I mentioned, we improve physical variables, it doesn't always need to improve performance. And what we're looking for, what's performance on the field, is a different thing than what we see in a gym setting, in a conditioning session, in a rehabilitation setting. All right. So we get to this principle of uh, systems thinking. All right. So system thinking is the belief that relationships between subcomponents, rather than rather than the sum of them, the connectedness, the connected component of them. <laughs> I take a drink here and go. All right. Systems thinking is looking at the relationship between these subcomponents. Essentially, that the performance of the system is not the sum of them, but the interaction of the subcomponents. That's the main premise. 
the principles of, sim of uh, systems thinking, that we're looking at the big picture. We're not breaking down into isolated components and focusing on that. We're balancing short and long-term perspectives. We're understanding what's best for the weekend, for a month's time, for later in the season, and not just how to, how to, not just how to maximize my impact right now. We're recognizing the dynamic, complex, and independent nature of the systems, that what I do is going to have an impact on technical, tactical, psychological. It's not just an isolated variable. We're taking into account both the measurable and the non-measurable factors, and I'm going to make, make references because I think we're very good at, and it is very important to collect, to, uh, to quantify what we're doing. That is an important part of it. But sometimes we're less, we're less responsive and open to taking in some of those qualitative qualities. And I find this with dealing with technical coaches in particular. What counts as intuition all the time is actually inherent knowledge that exists in a lot of stakeholders in an organization. But because they can't quantify that, we can often be dismissive. And to Nathan's point about the swimmers, um, coaches and people that people have a lot of there's a lot of information there. A lot of what appears subjective and experiential, but there's some real gold in that. I think we can be a bit dismissive of that information at times. We can get caught up in the minutia and being able to quantify our interventions. <coughs> and this last point of remembering that we are all part of the system in which we function, that we each influence each other and are influenced by each other. So we know we have an impact on a football program, the football program has an impact on an athletic performance program. All right, this guy is going to summarize it much better than me. I'm actually going to credit Nathan in sending this video, but the last couple of slides here that I've been stuttering through. And therefore, when a system is taken apart, it loses its essential properties. If I bring an automobile into this room and disassemble it, although every single part's in this room, I don't have an automobile. Because the system is not the sum of the behavior of its parts, it's a product of their interactions. And that's been said here in many ways over and over today. Now, what does that mean? If we have a system of improvement that's directed at improving the parts taken separately, you can be absolutely sure that the performance of the whole will not be improved. And that can be rigorously proven. But most applications of improvement programs are directed at improving the parts taken separately, not the whole. The proof is complex and I won't bore you with it. Let's just take a simple example. I read in the New York Times recently that 457 different automobiles are available in the United States. Let's buy one of each and bring them into a large garage. Let's then hire 200 of the best automotive engineers in the world and ask them to determine which car has the best engine. Suppose they come back and say the Rolls Royce has the best engine. We'll make a note of it. Which one has the best transmission, we ask them. And they go over the test and come back and say the Mercedes does. Which one has the best battery? Come back and say the Buick does. And one by one, for every part required for an automobile, they tell us which is the best one available. Now we take that list, give it back to them, and say remove those parts from those cars, put them together into the best possible automobile. Because now we'll have an automobile consisting of all the best parts. What do we get? You don't even get an automobile. For the obvious reason, the parts don't fit. The performance of the system depends on how the parts fit, not how they act, they can separate. Hey, way better than me, eh? That guy gets it. So that's uh, Dr. Ross Acoff. Uh, he's based at the University of Pennsylvania. He's passed away now, but he's one of the pioneers of systems thinking. And man, that just makes so much sense to me. I don't know if that resonates with people in the audience, but um, Nathan sent me that off from the back of our discussions and, and really um, kicked on my thinking in this, um, in this sphere. All right, I'm going to do a mic drop here. This is where you take out your phone and you say tweet, at Shane Lee Han, at play. This is the jaw-dropping statement. Good players win games. That's the... That's the one to take out. But we know this, right? We know that th this is what we already know. This is why we're getting a, why it's an obvious thing when you kind of see it. So we're taking a complex organism, a person, and placing them in a complex environment of a game. There's multiple inputs there. It's not an input output activity. And it's not to be dismissive of other sports, but we know, we know in a sport like track cycling that there's probably a higher correlation between physical inputs, improving physical variables and improving performance. If we can improve lower body strength, if we can improve power output, 
then we'll likely push more force through the pedals, we'll likely go quicker around the velodrome. That's not the case in a team sport environment. That's just not it. There's multiple and many, and some we can't even quantify interactions into what team performance looks like. And for anyone who's interested in this concept, any of the work by Fergus Connolly, um, Game Changers, and The Process, I'd recommend reading and as recommended reading to follow up on this. But there's so many layers of complexity in team sport that it's hard to reduce the game to isolated metrics. And I think that's what we can do oft uh, oftentimes. And the reality is if you're a team sport player, not athlete, I should, I should really have athlete in there, team sport player, you're trying to balance technical acumen, tactical acumen, technical proficiency, physical competence, and psychological composure in order to perform at an elite level. And that's just, the primary method for doing that is availability and health the majority of the time. So coming back to this premise of systems thinking, team sport performance is the sum of these components, is the interaction of these components and not the sum of these components. It's not about maximizing physical variables, it's about optimizing physical variables in the presence of other inputs. And I think our role in the team sport setting, that 10 or 15%, is to help facilitate team performance, understand the interaction of your role with other components in the, in the setting. All right, this is my personal solution to it. We're working through us all the time, nice and easy. This is my conceptual framework for athletic performance intervention design in the team sports setting. And we'll talk it through the layers here one by one. But essentially running through these components is I think what helps me make decisions in the team sports setting. At the center of this, and I don't think we do this particularly well as practitioners, is understanding what the organizational goals are. Do we actually know what we're trying to achieve as an organization? And I guarantee it, everyone will say, oh, we're trying to win the, we're trying to win the league. That, that's not the reality of the vast majority of sports. And I learned this the hard way again, if you're an, an organization like the Melbourne Rebels, that's a sport that's trying to establish itself in the Victorian sporting landscape. Something like the commercial aspect of that business is has probably is a disproportionate part of the day-to-day -day running of that club than someone like the Sydney Swans or I am now, which is a very established brand. So you've got to understand the constraints and the context of that environment when you're making decisions. You don't get annoyed when one of your star players has to miss the gym session for a media appearance because ultimately, what are we trying to achieve and what's the hierarchy of needs within the organization? So what are the unique challenges facing our organization? Do I understand that as an athletic performance coach? What are we trying to achieve? What does success actually look like? Because people will say it's winning championships every year. Reality, that's probably not the case in every organization. What are our priorities? Um, how do we orientate and spread out our resources? So this PRSA concept of uh, priority setting resource allocation is big in healthcare. And it's obvious in those sort of scenarios. You get a certain amount of budget, you can't put money into absolutely every wing of healthcare. You go, what's our actual priorities? Do we know what those are? Let's orientate time and resources in that. And if that's not, if there's a collective discussion on that and it's not towards athletic development and you're aware of that, then at least you're aware of the constraints of your role. What's my role in supporting these outcomes? All right, this next layer, demands of the game. This is that base layer that's your 85 to 90%. I do think we do this quite well. It's an overarching needs analysis of the given sport that you're in. It provides the base layer program design by informing of the, the general demands of your sport. Classic one in AFL, which really helped me, is this uh, Johnson and Black paper. It's an example of a meta-analysis of various papers. It gives you, this is the bit we're used to, right? We're good at this. How far do they run? What's the average high speed running? How many tackles do they do in a game? What does it look like, etc. Provides a global picture of the requirements of AFL football in this case, without delving into some of the contextual elements for your organization and your team. Next there, down. This is the bit I think that I'm interested in that I don't think we do so well. So have we engaged the stakeholders in our, in our organization, primarily our football coaches, I would say, in our roles? Uh, do we understand what the vision is for this organization and team? Do we have a clear understanding of the game model? Are we present at training? Are we present at team meetings? Are we in constant dialogue with the coaches? Are we students of the game? Do we understand what's going on uniquely in our environment? Asking this question of where does athletic performance sit in the performance hierarchy at a given time? And again, we often see this is some great work in AFL. I keep uh, maybe accused of cherry picking here a little bit, but this Sullivan paper from um, 2014, I think is performed for Carlton um, in, in the AFL setting. And the findings of this study, there's an inverse relationship between successful technical actions and physical outputs, and an inverse relationship between um, physical output and the coach's perception of player performance. We see that all the time now. We see the player who's like running around all day, well done, really high GPS numbers, but your actual technical interventions or the quality of your technical interventions didn't impact the game. And the classic example of anyone's familiar with football is Lionel Messi or he doesn't run. It's not about running, it's about impactful moments on games, which the guy does. Um, do we understand the stylistic demands of the team? 
distinct tactical demands from the coaches are associated with distinct physical demands. Are we wary of those? Are we training athletes appropriately? As an, as an athletic performance department, are we making decisions which supports these organizational goals and the signature style of play? Positional demands, again, I think we're pretty good at this. This feeds into that, uh, some of the more overarching demands of the game. We understand that forwards need to be trained a little bit differently to backs in rugby union, that inside forwards need to be trained a little bit different to ruckmen in, the, in AFL. Um, we understand some of those, those positional differences and we understand that we need to tailor athletic performance interventions to support that. And then lastly, uh, I think we're quite good at this, individual athlete pro of profiling. Obviously, Nathan's mentoring this. This is an example of um, some of ours. Do we understand, are we aware of where our athletes sit in certain physical components? This is an example of some of what we've done at the, uh, we've done at the, we've done at the Swan, some of their little diagram at the bottom here, some of their dynamic strength scores, two kilometer time trial, speed, etc. And then on the right, uh, our force velocity profile that we've done this year. Big shout out to Robbie. Get a boy. Yeah. <laughs> Him and Leo came okay, in, helped us make some good decisions there. But I think we're good in this space. We understand it's important. We understand that either, either we have the expertise to, um, to gather this information and make some individual training direct, uh, decisions, or we understand that as experts like Robbie and Leo at VALS, who we can call upon and can help us in that area. We're good at things we can objectify. We're good at things that are technically based. The bits I'm less, so, less sure of is, do we understand the organizational goals? Do we understand the distinct playing style and how we can support that? All right, that's a kind of a concept of how I at least devise athletic performance interventions at the minute. Happy ending time. So here we go. That's it, we solved it. Perfect program. Got hockey by 100 points by Geelong in the final. Probably a bit to do. It's not, no way, that's, that's not game on. Um, all right, so this is a little bit of current practice from what we're doing. Primarily my remit's in the strength and power space, so I'll highlight that, but I also think this uh, concept of systems thinking is actually across our organization. Um, probably just on a bit more, a bit more nuanced on the, on the theory behind it, but I actually think these decisions are happening all the time. So first thing you do, the first thing we've done, we engage the stakeholders, I engage the stakeholders. What are the goals of our organization? If you're at an organization like the Swans, we're trying to win the competition. That's what we're about. That's what it was like at Leicester Tigers. When I was at the Melbourne Rebels, like if we're really honest, the goal is not to win the competition. Like that's, that's not it. What does success look like? What does it need? What, what are the things that support that? Probably in hindsight, need to have a more honest conversation there about what success looks like. What's the tactical vision for the team? How are we trying to play? How are the Swans trying to play football? There's going to be some nuances there as compared, com, compared to Geelong, Brisbane, Carlton, etc. What actions support this vision? What is their order of importance? Every tactical, every a tactical vision is underpinned by technical actions. Every technical action has an under, underpinning physical dimension. If we understand how the team are trying to play, we understand some of the technical actions that are associated with it. We can support those technical actions through the physical dimension that supports it. What does the player's individual athletic profile look like, and how can we develop this appropriately to support the organisation? What are the player's needs? engaging other stakeholders, uh, medical history, are they better off allocating time towards other resources, that priority setting resource, priority setting resource allocation, are they better off spending time with a line coach instead of spending more time with me in the gym or doing uh, conditioning interventions. <clears throat> so this is probably a leftover from version one really. This one on the right here, physical demands of blood football. I actually think this one's a little bit general. This is a version one, we probably get a little bit more nuance this year as so I'll take you through. But uh, a good friend of mine, Jack Naylor, he's worked in European soccer for a long time. Um, at the time he was working for Orby Leipzig, who uh, big team under Red Bull in the, in the Bundesliga. And they were trying to work on a process of, Red Bull have a pretty distinctive style of play. They've got a tactical periodized, periodized model. The Red Bull football group has a um, distinct style of play and they were trying to work out what physical metrics supported that unique style of play. Their game model, they own football teams all over the world. They wanted every player that they were recruiting into that organization to meet certain standards, to perform at Orby, Orby Leipzig, or sorry, perform the Orby football model so you could take a player from the team in Brazil, transport them to the team in Germany, and, and they can fit seamlessly in. So we were looking at that, this is probably version one for us of what are the different sub-components of the game? What do they look like from a physical perspective? What are we trying to do? What are some of the underpinning um, physical, what are some of the underpinning technical actions? And then what's the physical dimension that supports that? So as I mentioned, every uh, technical action underpinned by a physical dimension, 
For us, I know some of the key ones that came out were supporting contested possession. What does that actually look like? What does best practice look, for, look like around contested possession? We're one of the highest pressure teams in the competition. What does des best technical practice look like? Um, what does it look best? How does that look best practice technically that we can break it down into a physical subcomponent and develop that subcomponent? Okay, version two, a lot of text on this page. Just look at the top line. Um, I'll take you through a little bit of a journey on this too. So I don't think I'm giving away any sensitive information here, but these essentially are the four key pillars that we know we have to be supporting as an athletic performance program. Our primary goal is to support Bloods football, support Swans football. Last year I had as the support contested, support contested possession, support pressure and availability as the last, we had three. One of the realizations probably, particularly off the back of the grand final is that we probably need to spend more time developing our individuals. That's why we're working a bit more closely with Vals this year trying to uh, profile our athletes to get more specific with the individual component. Um, but if we take the first three, one, two, three, when we win contested possession and we win pressure, we win 93% of our games. That's what we do. They're both important variables on their own. When we win those two variables, we win 93% of our games. Now, the people here that work in footy and Rob who works with me said to me, like, he's like, those, team, those things are important for every team. I'm like, they are, I get it, but it's like a scrum in rugby union. You go, everyone needs to scrum. For South Africa, it's a powerhouse. It's your absolute weapon. It's, your number, it's one of your number one priorities. And for us, if you're a pressing team in soccer, yeah, pressing is done by all football teams. If you're at Liverpool Football Club, it's a key fundamental part of how you play the game. It's part of your, it's a key characteristic. So yes, everyone's doing it, but for you, you dial that bit right up. You dial that bit right up and what supports that. So last year I had contested possession support pressure as our top three, as our top two, sorry, with availability as last. Brought this to the head coach. Actually, a preface this. The key conversation you can have if you're a team, in working team sports setting is sit down with your analyst, have a cup of coffee, Find out firstly what's important for your team, what are you trying to do, what are some of the key metrics. That allows you to have better conversations with coaches, so it's made about engaging different stakeholders. I had a, a supporting contested possession, supporting pressure, and availability as our third. Head coach looked at it and said to me, completely agree with these, these are important variables for how we're trying to play, but make availability your number one. It's like we've got, when the, we're in the bottom third age profile of the squad, uh, we've got majority or a lot of our players under 23 or 24, it's like they need time playing together, understanding the imposition of, or the, the game model and what we're trying to do technically, and they need to build cohesion together. Okay, that becomes your number one priority. Now, without going into the details, does that mean that there's a conservative prescription not doing anything? No, of course not. We know that training athletes and training them hard, of course, is a, has an injury preventive effect. But it's also a different prescription to saying, geez, we're not strong enough, fucking get after strength. I mean, that's a different prescription. So it's a bit more mindful in how you make decisions because you've engaged the stakeholders, you understand the priorities for the organization, you understand what's going to help team performance. All right, so as I said, we've got a young team. We need time together. We need to build cohesion. That's the number one thing. We're a high pressure team. We're good in transition. What does that tell me? Geez, we need a, we need a strength and power program that supports our running ability or change of direction ability. We're going to be a high pressure team. We're going to be doing a lot of repeat sprint efforts. There's physical components that underpeat that. Around the uh, contested possession, we need to be aggressive on the floor, we need to be able to drop our body height, we need to be strong in low positions. Okay, mobility and flexibility is gonna be an important part of our program because one part's expressing force, another part's being able to get into, get into the right positions um, to compete at those levels. We need to be good in the air, competing in the air. Okay, being strong at long and obscure trunk positions is important. We need to have, again, good mobility and flexibility around our thoracic. We need to be strong in, in the face of perturbations in those positions. That's something we're trying to train, a physical dimension that underpins the technical action. So as a athletic performance department, we better be supporting contested possession. We better be supporting pressure. We better be trying to get our best players on the field as often as possible. They're your KPIs. It's not, here's your, I worked at Geelong. This is the way we train Geelong. I'm gonna to go to the Swans, do the same thing. That's what I did at Leicester Tigers when I went, or at Melbourne Rose when I came from Leicester Tigers. There's nuances to how this organization is, is trying to play the game. All right, how does this influence our decision making? So again, this is, I primarily limited this to a strength and power perspective, but um, I think it applies to um, across athletic performance interventions. So what's important for us? So this is our order of importance, Swans football, injury mitigation, Developing a technical model for pressure, what pressure looks like, developing a, a technical model for what contested possession looks like. We need to have every individual in our program doing components in their training day that supports these outcomes. After that, we can drop it down to the layer of the individual. Are they strong enough? Are they heavy enough? We can utilize Robbie and Leo and the boys at Val along with our dynamic strength information. We can use that information to make better decisions. 
Um, if you are strong enough, if you are heavy enough, into your force velocity profiling groups, tailor your programming to support your individual athletic profile. But these bits at the top, the team bits, I think everyone's doing the stuff at the bottom, the player bits, the individual bit, a bit better than they are, understanding what the team outcomes are, what are the team KPIs and how we can support that. Yeah, I've been, been through this. So essentially working with the coaches, I think the key thing is working with the different stakeholders. These are some of the components that are actually developing those technical models and understanding what's important there. As I mentioned earlier, availability is really important. doesn't mean we're being conservative, but it's a different prescription in my mind to being really aggressive to de uh, develop a physical variable. We feel, of course, physical is important. It's probably not the limiting factor in our problem. Um, contested possession, what does it look like? Break down that technical model. Our acceleration into the contest to get to the ball is really important. Our ability to drop body height is really important. Strong and low positions in the face of perturbations. Our ability to disassociate our trunk in the air really important. Um, we're dialing up those aspects of our program. We're dialing up flexibility, dialing up mobility, dialing up mobile coordination based training. Pressure two way running, or um, pressure two way running. We're trying to be a high pressure team. Our hip conditioning, our uh, running interventions, our, any of our isometric work, our run, run specific isometric work designed to support our running game to support pressure. Every technical action has an underpinning physical dimension. And one of the important things is if the game model changes, if there's a change in coaches, if there's a, a change in playing style, then we need to revisit this, readapt, go again. Don't just carry it forward. I'm going to skip this one because we're, we're going on a little bit. Um, right, this is a constant feedback loop. First thing, engage your stakeholders. Understand the game model. What are we trying to do as a team? Work with your, work with your athlete profiling, understand what they look like. Collect your data, of course it's important. Collect your, uh, your force velocity profiling, collect your dynamic strength numbers, collect your GPS data, use that to inform decisions. Work with your medical team for previous injury history. But again, it's a constant feedback loop. Having those conversations with your key stakeholders, understanding the game model, I think is really important. And where I think this really helps, when you can relate everything back to the football program, every conversation that I have with a player is in relation to these KPIs that support, support Swan's football. I also think it makes it easier. When you say someone is weak on the field, you have those conversations, some guy's not strong. When you have those, these objective markers behind it, you can, say, you can say to a coach, you can say, look, I understand you feel that this guy isn't strong when he plays, Objectively, it would appear that his physical strength characteristics are really good. We've seen that. My advice, my recommendation is that they spend more time with you and less with me because that's what's going to help them be a better player. Or we work together to work on an intervention there to transfer that. So it's not that the objective data is unimportant, but I think the bit we need to get better at is understanding, engaging the stakeholders, understanding the KPIs, understanding how we're trying to play the game. Do you want time for another video? Everyone likes I don't know if this really fits, to be honest, but you know, everyone loves a video. Um, I'll give a little highlight of what this looks like in the Strength and Power program. This is in our, uh, yeah, Carmen's laughing because I was like, I don't know if I'm going to play the video because it doesn't really fit, but I'll do it. Um, I guess this is an example of maybe some of our interventions, particularly around the Strength and Power program, mostly gym based because I don't, head coach wouldn't go too well bringing the camera out in the pitch. But um, again, like you can look at the exercises and selection, but I think the key thing is everything you'll see in this video is related back in some way to the football program. That's the idea, that's the starting point. You don't start with the exercises. There's some of the, I tend to record a lot of the Franz Bosch type exercises in this because they're the bits, I'm just recording less bench presses and deadlifts and all these sort of things. But some people will come to me and they say, oh, can you talk to me about the Franz Bosch principles and coordination based training? I'm like, I can, but that's just a tool that we're using because we feel it works with this environment and what we're trying to do to, to support the game model, the game style and the organizational goals. I know, I'll play it. Then we can go to questions.
All right, so um, the exercises are one thing there. I think it's, if, uh, it's more the process of thinking, in fact, if a player came to me or if anyone comes here, I think there's a justification for everything being in our strength and power program that relates back to the football program. That's a much easier conversation with the, with the players than in terms of why we're doing it. We're the supporting availability, we're supporting contested possession, we're supporting pressure, or trying to develop you as an athlete to, to make you perform best in the game. All about the football program. In a way, I think there actually, there is no strength and conditioning program. There's, there's only the football program, which is a physical arm. We're trying to support that. So I guess to finish, um, how do I think you can apply a systems thinking approach in your environment? Right. If you can, and if you're lucky, pick an organization aligned to this mindset. And uh, recently did my ACA level three, and part of that is a reflective piece. And part of that, Dan Baker said to me, he said, um, he said I really like your thinking. He's like, but it means you probably wouldn't be happy working at every club because not everyone wants that engaging process. If you can, if you're lucky enough, Try and break out of your box, merge lanes, speak with other stakeholders, try and understand what you're, what you're trying to do, tailor your approach that way. Expose your personal bias, be open to different points of view. When I was at Leicester, I had this mindset, we build the engine, coaches tune it. My job's develop physiology. I took that to the Rebels and I learned it the hard way that that hard approach is not a, um, that bias that I carried didn't, didn't help me. Um, if you move organization, you go somewhere new, and I've stolen this, um, Nathan's name? Scott? Scott Pollock, because uh, I saw him at N Swiss. He raised a really good point. He said, uh, if you go into a new organization or you're dealing with a new head coach, you don't need to rush into making a performance impact. Spend time assessing the landscape, understanding the context, build relationships. Then you'll be able to make better decisions going forward there. I heard a comment when the groups we were talking about um, going into a new organization. Someone said, it's hard because you've got to go in there and you've got to you got to hit the ground running. I actually think that's where you make mistakes. You don't need to hit the ground running. You need to come in, you probably need to keep going what was there, assess the landscape, and then make informed decisions from there. It's not about coming in and maximizing your area. That's not what it is. You need to understand the context of the environment. You need to understand how your uh, component interacts with the other subcomponents of the system. Engage the stakeholders, understand the organization, how you can support the goals of the organization, how you can support them. Be an interactive planner, include and engage the stakeholders. I'm going to the head coach of that document, I'm presenting it to him, Are you, do you agree with this? I'm going to coaches and I'm sitting down with line coaches and being like, tell me and show me what good quality contested possession looks like so I know what best practice is so then we can try and work out what the planning process is, what the physical dimension is and how we can help you. Actively review and reflect both personally on your own interactions and your own, um, your own behaviors, your own biases, but also review and reflect with the stakeholders. You don't need to be defensive of your area. If you think it's not going right or you're unsure, like check it and engage these other people. Tap into that experiential knowledge and that subjective knowledge um, and that qualitative knowledge that coaches have, which maybe at times we don't value as much. Um, I think this is really important. This is where networks like this are really important. I keep mentioning Nathan and Carmen, but they're two big ones to me for 
interacting with colleagues, uh, peers who are in, like they're facing similar problems. And it's not maybe that the solution that Nathan's been exposed to, the magic, or Carmen is at a, a Perth Glory. It might, that not might be the right solution for me, but engage your colleagues, engage your network, and think about their process and examine their process for how they're doing it. Um, and then lastly, the signature process. I said version two is different, to, is different to last year, and the origins of this for me are really that exposure to tactical periodization probably four or five years ago. So get something started, have a conversation with the coach. That could be iteration one. Try and figure out what you're doing from a gain type perspective. Understand the needs of the organization. Put something in place that's more considerate, more holistic, less reductionist, more holistic thinking. Have a, system, have a systems thinking approach. Start it, reflect, and then you can grow it from there. It's an iterative process. All right, thank you. First and foremost, wasn't too bad. Past the seven minute mark, which is for us. Um, how did the gravy video go down? Good, bad? Yeah, go down. Um, any questions, you can follow up me afterwards. So it's a bit more of a philosophical way of looking at it. Any critique to it, just, I'm really interested in this. Like, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, or you have a different opinion, or you've read something, please come and say it to me. Um, and just to finish with a task, actually, Nathan kind of stitched me up, actually, because he stole my task. But we might just break into a, a little groups anyway and talk about this. Um, I guess I want to revisit that question at the start in your groups. How do you define your role? What's your reflection on that now? Do you think it's accurate and has that maybe changed off the back of what I've, what I've said? Maybe it doesn't, maybe you still disagree with it. Consider the, um, as part of that discussion, think about your environment and the unique demands that are in there. What, what are some of the contextual uh, variables that are really important for your environment? Um, and then I just want to have a think about and discuss the process of you engaging. Who are the key stakeholders? Talk about who the key stakeholders are in your environment and who are some of the people that you need to have conversations with in order to make better decisions.